I would like to call now our last panelist, Gurumurti Kasinathan. Um, you haven't seen him in the original program, uh, but we're very happy to have his contribution to this webinar. He's the director and one of the founders of IT for Change. Guru leads projects in the area of digital technologies in education. He also works in the areas of school leadership and free and open digital technologies. He has been a visiting faculty at TISS deemed university for their master's program in education, where he has taught, uh, has taught education leadership and management and ICT and education courses. Guru, thanks again for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Juliana. Happy to be here and wonderful to hear Madhuresh and the other two panelists who spoke before me. I'll focus my remarks specifically on the uh, danger from big tech in this whole push for multi-stakeholder arrangements and gov governance. Uh, over the last 20 years, IT for Change has seen that in various sectors, these big tech corporations have been able to use their economic power and also the large perception that is held in minds of people that technology has done good things for people. So they have this impression that, you know, Google is a company that ostensibly was set up with the motto of, you know, seeing no evil, doing no evil. That is how it was set up in the initial stages. So with the halo around them, they're able to more aggressively come into the governance uh, spaces. And uh, while in other sectors, we have had multilateral governance arrangements give way to multi-stakeholderism. In the tech space, we find that from the very beginning, multi-stakeholderism in governance has been touted as the way to govern. And that is simply because in other traditional areas, the governments have had a significant role. As far as technology is concerned, it is these private sector companies, it is business, businesses that have been providing technology services to the world. And I'll quote a Republican senator who said uh, several years back, he said there's something called the Google test. And he meant if Google can do it, Google should do it and everybody else should stay clear of that. And of course, from his point of view, it also included governance of the uh, technology spaces, the internet. So uh, as far as the internet governance or the technology governance arrangements have been concerned, from the very beginning, the business sector has very strongly pushed for multi-stakeholderism as a default method of governance, where the private sector has a very eminent role, the states also have, and as a consequence, as Madhuresh noted, civil society voices are always weaker. And what began as a very strong multi-stakeholderism push in the tech spaces have now started permeating into more traditional spaces of governance, Education has been amongst the last to be affected, as Madhurish pointed out, and that is simply because education has not been the space where typically businesses have tried to make money uh, across the world, because in the global north, public systems are still very dominant and strong, and in the global south, because of very huge underinvestment in education, typically there's no great market to speak of. There would be maybe a very small percentage of elite schools which might be able to afford technology but the large school systems run by the governments have typically been too resource starved to be able to afford technology and in a large country like let's say for in india technology has typically not been able to uh, you know it doesn't work but now one very important thing we need to keep in mind is covid has completely changed the uh, paradigm during two years India, for example, one, was one of the worst countries in terms of school closure for almost the entire two-year period. Most provincial governments in India kept schools closed. And when schools were closed, obviously, everybody felt that technology was the only way for teachers to connect to students and online education became something of a mainstream idea. And over two years, uh, attempts were made to make online education a kind of a norm. Thankfully, the pandemic effects have weakened a lot and schools are you know, back in physical uh, form. Nevertheless, the corporations are trying to suggest that the new normal of education is one where technology has a very important role to play. And if you see the tech space, every few years, there is a new hype about technology. 
a new thing comes in. So some years back, it was gamification of learning. And now the new kid on the block is personalized learning using artificial intelligence. And everybody, the businesses would like, would like us to believe that artificial intelligence is going to sort of solve the problems in every sector. We've already seen that not only does it not solve problems in many cases, but it actually aggravates existing problems. And in some cases, it causes harm positively. And therefore, the role of AI has to be very, very carefully considered. In the case of education, AI will certainly have very serious challenges in terms of aggravating existing socio cultural economic inequities in the system, because by definition, it functions by reproducing the past. And many countries, especially India, our education systems are heavily, uh, you know, non uh, are inequitable and AI will further reinforce inequities. Unfortunately, in spite of the recognition that AI can be harmful, it is seen as an important way forward in education. The National Education Policy of India, for example, which was released a couple of years back, says that these technologies have to be really seen for their value in education. Recently in Davos, in the World Economic Forum, a couple of provincial governments from India announced a tie-up with Baiju's. Baiju's is the uh, big tech as far as education is concerned. And I, I should have mentioned the word platform. So these new tech businesses are coming in the form of platforms. And uh, we can see platforms in different areas of the economy, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Uber. These are all platforms in different spaces of the economy and society. And Baiju's wants to be a similar platform in the area of education. What a platform wants to become, a platform wants to become a monopoly or an oligopoly. And in education, we know that if we have a monopoly determining what education should be, the entire idea of education as a right, the entire idea of education as a process by which we can bring about equity and justice in society will completely go for a toss. The arrangements with Baiju's have been announced, although there is no clue as to what will happen with the data that Baiju's will harvest. We all know that artificial intelligence relies on data harvesting. And in the case of education, the important thing to consider is this data is going to belong to children and children are going to be even more vulnerable to data harvesting, to surveillance capitalism than adults are. And this is a very, very big danger. So multi-stakeholderism has typically eroded uh, issues of justice and equity in other spaces. But in the, from the tech thing, the harm potential is even higher. So it's not only simply at a governance level, but at an individual safety and security level, tech is going to create problems by, incur, incur, by its incursions into the uh, education space. And of course, with privatization, we are going to see increasing certification and inequity. That is on the economic side. On the pedagogic side, uh, Madhuri spoke repeatedly about how the whole idea of skilling has become important and how we are moving rapidly away from the ideas of holistic ideas of education. Education is really about creating a new society, about making democracy work. We are already seeing the ill effects of social media actually affecting democracy at large. And in fact, our education systems have to gear up to counter this whole you know, issue of hate news, propaganda, fake news, which is create WhatsApp universities, which is creating havoc in society. The school system and the college system have to actually counter that by bringing in ideas of equity, justice, and publicness into the system's principles. But the privatization through platforms like Baiju's was taking us exactly in the opposite direction. Apart from data harvesting, which I mentioned, uh, the whole idea of holistic education goes for a toss when we use artificial intelligence to sort of atomized learning into what is called as learnification. So this is a term that is used to suggest that instead of education, we now have learnification where learners are put through more and more atomized experiences of learning, which don't help in conceptual understanding and which don't certainly give them an idea of holistic uh, development and upbringing. Apart from the pedagogical problem of learnification, big tech has always promoted centralization and centralization of education systems is something that is inimical to the ideas of good education. Now, the, there is one big problem here. Governments also love centralization because that gives them the illusion of being in control, illusion of being able to do things for the people. But we know that as far as governance is concerned, centralization is not a good approach because it puts power in the hands of few elite in society. 
and the idea of education as being something that can promote prosperity and uh, benefit of all welfare of all is countered by the idea of using technology for further further centralizing education systems and education processes so assessments can get centralized curriculum content gets centralized and the control of the teacher goes down so we are seeing gig workers in every sphere of the platform economy and we know gig workers uh, they form what is called the precariat they live in a very precarious condition with byju's we can see more and more of this happening to teachers teachers are going to get teaching is going to get deskilled and teachers are going to be the new precariat uh, again moving away from uh, a secure permanent job uh, as a professional to you know waiting for the call from byju's to take a tuition class pretty much like how uber driver is waiting for the platform to allot him a job and this aspect of centralization this aspect of labor precariat is going to affect teachers at scale and this is obviously going to have harmful effects on education i'll just mention one point before i close so to counter this it for change has been part of setting up of what we call the national coalition on the education emergency which was set up in the year 2021 last year, a year more than a year back and the national coalition on the education emergency was formed to bring about greater awareness of the education emergency caused by covid and this pandemic caused school closure has created a hype about dead tech so one of the priorities for the national coalition on the education emergency is to suggest to governments that ed tech the way they are imagining through a uh, entity like byju's or through personalized learning is certainly not going to help children who are suffering from school closures but there are alternate models where technology can be used for decentralized governance and we have seen in so many examples across the world that technology actually can promote decentralized governance technology can promote participatory governance technology can promote uh, greater power moving from the centralized uh, to the peripheries and that is something that can happen in education there are excellent examples of that in india as well so the provinces of kerala and tamil nadu for example have been using technology in ways that support the public uh, system that support teachers and the support teacher development there are models that are already available these models are relevant not only from india's point of view but across the global context too as byju's and similar platforms threaten to go across the world to push their ideas of privatized governance of education to push privatized curriculum to put push uh, privatized models of pedagogy that disempower teachers we need to counter them with public models which are already available and which is something that the national coalition on the education emergency has been promoting in india for a long time uh, one last thing i would like to say in the platform space an additional danger uh, which i think has not been covered so far is whole issue of venture capital now traditional business which is funded through traditional funding mechanisms actually is less risk pro risk uh, taking whereas venture capital funded enterprises tend to uh, adopt extremely what they call as innovative behavior but these innovative innovations can actually create huge threats for the economy and society and you know we all are familiar with mark zuckerberg saying Uh, move fast and break things of course the things that are not that will be broken are not those which belong to facebook they'll probably belong to vulner vulnerable and marginalized sections in society so the whole idea of venture capital funding has pushed these platform companies to take more and more risks to identify the innovations that will help them become monopolies because the end game of venture capital funding is to create that monopoly or an oligopoly and that is going to be a increasing danger to the idea of uh, you know multi multilateral governance or public uh, education as an idea uh, this is what i want to speak about uh, in terms of the technology impact uh, the platform impact on multi stakeholderism and i'm happy to take questions during the q and a thank you thank you guru um I'm I would like now to open the floor for questions and comments. If you would like to speak, please raise your hands right now. Um I will uh, given the time cons constraints we would ask you to be brief, uh, no more than 2 minutes. Uh do we have any questions in the chat or in the audience? Anyone wants to speak? Well, um while you think about it, um I would like to just uh, connect a question Well, that I had myself. Um, oh, is it is Vivek uh, trying to speak? 
Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So let, let's uh, hear Vivek then. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. So this is uh, Vivek here. Uh, my question is to Guru Murthy, uh, sir. Uh, there are so many uh, non-profit organizations. There are examples. Uh, and I'm from basically from Maharashtra. So I've seen some examples. Uh, they're distributing the subscription of Baiju's uh, free of cost uh, for initial, uh, let's say, four years, five years to, uh, to the community or their staff members as well. So uh, as a IT for change, how do you look at uh, it uh, firstly? And secondly, do we have any, uh, are we suggesting any uh, alternative model, if not, uh, 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 if not Baiju or uh, anything like that? So can you elaborate more on it? Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Um, anyone? I will, um, you can raise your hand while I'm speaking and uh, it's connected to what uh, Vivek uh, uh, asked. Um, when Madarash was presenting, he mentioned that now we have quite some money um, to bring technologies to schools everywhere, but we don't have any investments in buildings themselves. Um, in our exchange, Guru, um, you mentioned the development of toolkits to enhance teachers, agency and public education system. Um, sorry, Jen Hardy. Um, so, um, yeah, I my could question, hear you. Okay, good. My my question is um, how to if this toolkits that you were talking about, um, if an initiative that could be adapted uh, globally and locally, as I mentioned, um, how to contrast that with with regions where we don't have uh, investment in education and in infrastructure, basic infrastructure. For, for school uh, for schools. Thank yeah. you. So I'll quickly answer it in a couple of points. One is I think uh, Baiju's is giving away its services free. It's exactly like Uber providing discounted rides in the beginning. So all platforms or like Google provides uh, gratis services or Facebook services are gratis. Many services are provided free of cost by the platforms in the beginning. That is because they want to capture the market and they want to become a monopoly or a, or a duopoly or oligopoly. But once they do become the default, like we know in India, for example, that Uber and Ola have achieved a kind of a duopoly in the entire market. And the traditional auto rickshaw or the taxi business has suffered a lot. So Uber and Ola have become the default. Now they are skimming the market and overcharging both the consumers and the drivers. So in the, in the olden, in the initial phases, they gave discounts to the customers and they give incentives to the drivers and they capture the market. Once they do that, they will fleece. And that's the basic uh, business model of platforms where they want to price. Of course, in many cases, they won't even price the product because they get money out of selling the data. That's how, for example, Google and Facebook, which are the most profitable companies in the world, do not charge the people who use their products. So we don't pay anything for WhatsApp. We don't pay anything for Facebook. We don't pay anything for Google Maps. And that's because Google and Facebook are selling our data, harvesting our data for their economic benefits. That makes them one of the most profitable, amongst the most profitable companies in the world. There is an alternative to that. And I'll talk about education itself. And if you take the state of Kerala, I mentioned that. This, we have it for change has, of course, initiated several models of using technology which do not de-skill teachers, but which make teachers or workers at the central of technology use. And by using teachers to build teachers skills in using technology for teaching, to enable teachers to create contextual content, which digital technologies can allow, we have alternative models and toolkits by which the system can become stronger and educational objectives can be achieved. So it's not simply teachers are doing better, but the entire system is doing better. It is not a coincidence that Kerala is the best state in India as far as education is concerned, far ahead of other states, and it practices these alternative models. Baiju's went to Kerala government and Kerala government said, we are not interested in you. We don't want, we don't believe in your model. We believe in a tech model that actually promotes teachers role and the professional development of teachers. And that's what our models we have learned from Kerala too. These models are already at work. The only problem is that while Baiju's will advertise and you know sponsor the Indian cricket team, and have a very high visibility in everybody's mind, the state government of Kerala will not do that, or the state government of Tamil Nadu will not do that. So the models that are progressive and workable 
are not uh, people are not aware of that so that's one point to quickly answer uh, juliana's question actually the appropriate investment of scarce resources is a very very important point and it is very sad that you can have a computer in the building but you don't have drinking water uh, facility and i think these decisions of uh, very uh, unfortunate investments without understanding priority are made because in many countries including in india these investment decisions are made at, made at central levels they are not made at the school level if a school was given some money and told you decide what you want to spend it on they would probably spend on drinking water rather than have a computer but somebody sitting at the capital decided that everybody should have computer so in that sense technology investments are often made without consideration of the real situation on the ground and i want to point out here that the government of andhra pradesh in uh, which is a state in india has made a decision to spend 500 crore rupees which is a huge amount of money to buy tablets for the children when in all likelihood they are actually closing schools because they cannot afford to run the number of schools that they have in the state so that's a pathetic way of looking at investment uh, in technology but at the same time we don't need to imagine that educational technology always means to have an expensive computer or internet out there there are inexpensive contextual applications of technology that can be done for example language learning can do with a lot of audio materials with digital technologies will support i don't want to take too much time so i don't want to have this also a wrong idea that technology digital technology is only expensive and therefore unless you have everything else you don't need to look at digital technology that is not the case as well we need to look at appropriate investments in digital technology which will help uh, the school system without being extremely expensive and those are possible in the models that for example kerala and tamil nadu and the work of it for change has been focusing on thank you i'm really looking forward to knowing more about them um we have time for one last question maybe for our other panelists does anyone want to speak me hi agil hi vivek am i am i allowed to speak yes, one, please ask one that. more question yeah yes. so my the, my question is to madhuresh so uh, madhuresh sir uh, uh, am i audible yes please. perfectly yeah so sir uh, the, the uh, whatever have been said said uh, by all three panelists so can ppp model with the help of ppp model uh, can we continue let's say the, there are so many example uh, we can see uh we can we can we can uh, we can visit so many examples like in so many states or so many uh, districts of maharashtra or other states also uh there are there are schools uh, which are up to that they're, they're teaching to they're taking classes up to seventh standard uh, in the english medium let's say and after that uh, they are unable to take, continue with the classes it's a public run school so in in such cases can ppp model uh, get succeeded uh, with with appropriate regulations uh, like how will you analyze rather critically analyze it well uh, by in the education sector the ppp function i think uh, uh, werner and others can talk about it but my understanding of the ppp model comes from the infrastructure project development education being and health being one but i think in the health sector even in the road uh, construction and several even in the water water sector so some of the social sectors i would say and education comes under that some of the social sectors our ex our experience has been that the ppp uh, model generally tends to be wherever there is profit for the private uh, corporations they come in but if you look at the major chunk of money is the money which is coming from the public resources so it's not the that the, the public that the private partners are bringing resources what they bring in is uh, that they get uh, that they get uh, access to the government resources they get the even they take loan from the uh, uh, public sector banks and others but at the end of the day the actual input so if we think of the public private partnership then we really think that it's about uh, equal participation of all of them but somewhere it gets reduced to the idea that the public is the one who will front end a lot of the investments monetary hard resources 
and the actual benefits when it comes to that, it goes uh, more for the private sector. And this has been seen across the board. Um, and I would say that the, the highway, I think it, uh, that in Maharashtra and if, where we are coming from then India, and I think this case is also true across the other countries as well, that highways gets created using the money uh, and, and it's a lot of subsidies like, so we'll say for land acquisition, is done by the state where a major chunk of money, same with the infrastructure, the schools and everything are created by the state. Uh, and who provides, pays the teacher's salaries. So if it's a permanent teacher, then the government will pay for that. And where is the private sector coming in? Is it coming in only to say that, okay, we will do the course design for you. And same way they will say that, okay, we will do the road building for you. But then the road building, what it does is that it takes 30 years, 40 years, we are paying a uh, toll. Uh, uh, toll tax on the public. So I think the public ends up paying a lot more. And my experience is more on that side. So that's what I'm saying. But I think in the public sector as well, in the in the education sector as well, this doesn't seem to have worked um, because they, if, uh, yeah, I would leave it at that. That this doesn't seem to work. I would be more skeptical of uh, saying that the PPP would work. Um, and I think what we did see that the when the IT companies when they come in and say that they will provide the infrastructure for the IT infrastructure for uh, ICT education in the in the education sector, but they are not giving the so it's a PPP model. Most of it is PPP model, but their their investment into the uh, their investment into uh, uh, the quote unquote key infrastructure or the fundamental infrastructure necessary for. Uh, running a good school, uh, they don't invest into that. Um, a lot of that is still state owned, and but the profit sharing will be is completely uh, disproportionate to the investment they make. So I think the guiding motive is the profit, not the uh, not the social concern. I just want to quickly add uh, on the chat window, I have put a couple of links to articles. We did a study on PPPs in education in India and found out that, as Madhuresh said, PPPs inherently are prone to failure because the motivation of the private player and the motivation of education are usually in conflict. I've given a couple of links in the chat. People can look at it. Thank you, Guru Madhuresh. Thank you. Um, I'm now closing the floor as we don't have much more time, although I do have a few questions in my uh, private chat. Um, I would like to thank our panelists, our interpreters, and especially the Global Campaign for Education for making this happen. A big thanks also to Guru and to IT for Change for this last minute, but very insightful contribution and to Madhuresh for filling in so brilliantly. As mentioned in the opening of this webinar, uh, this is a part of an effort to expose the risks and dangers of multi-stakeholderism. We have now looked deeper into the multi-stakeholderism whole of education, but as mentioned by Werner, this trend is expanding fast and in every sector of international governance. The Global Campaign for Education, IT for Change, and the Transnational Institute are here today as members of the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism, a coalition of networks, organizations, and social movements joining forces to stop the corporate capture of multilateral governance. If you're interested uh, on the issue, we have also held a webinar lunch for launching this entire book um, and another one on the chapter of health held by People's Health Movement and D282. Um, we also had a very recent webinar on uh, the COVID crisis and multi stakeholderism. So I invite you to uh, look at it. I'll put the links uh, in the chat in a moment. Um, if you have any questions or if your organization wants to join us in this struggle, please send us an email to pwgm at riseup.net. Let's finish up putting Laura's invitation to let our political imagination flow at the center of our activism. I hope you have enjoyed this session as much as I have. I have and uh, thank you for being here, for sharing your thoughts, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>